I always like to uh, start my, my ID programs, especially anything that's related to Raptors with a few videos to hopefully inspire and get people excited. A couple of these, I'm sure many of you have seen before. Um, I still love to show them and I hope that uh, you'll enjoy seeing them again. Uh, for those of you who are new, I hope you really enjoy these. And uh, the first one's gonna be a little different. Um, and before we get into the meat of identifying raptors, I wanna talk about why we do this um, and, and what's so important about going out there and, and counting these birds. because they're in, in most environments are kind of the primary predator. They're majestic when they're soaring. If they're sitting in a tree, they can they look right at you and you have you make contact. To me sort of like a tiger or a cheetah or uh, a lion that because of that hunting aspect of it, uh, there's a special mystique to them. They're very powerful flyers, um, very inspiring, and I think the fact that they're predators makes them a little more exciting than your average bird. Just seeing the peregrines, you know, maybe going after ducks or something and just coming in like a dive bomber after those ducks, it's just fascinating to see that, that kind of power. Uh, from the late Roger Torrey Peterson, I, I just think it encapsulates so much, uh, you know, why we do clamber on top of ridge tops or funnel points along the lakeshore, uh, which we find ourselves doing at Mackinac uh, every spring and fall. And, and, you know, the next two videos for me, you know, more or less give us uh, a little insight as to the excitement and, and some of the draw to raptors and, and why we come to these sites to hopefully uh, get a chance at experiencing something really unique uh, about just how amazing these birds are. And the first one is a, of an American kestrel hover hunting as the birds looking for prey. And notice the head on this bird is absolutely locked on, totally still. And the body now here in slow motion, you can see the body and the feet, look at the tail absolutely flailing around with the head and, and her eyes are absolutely locked on looking for prey. Um, just a wonderful um, adaptation of, of that bird in terms of how they hunt. Uh, the next one here is actually really cool and very special because it came directly from Mackinac. You're gonna notice what makes Michigan famous in the background here. Um, but these are two bald eagles that uh, we were at the, the water bird watch early in the morning um, and these, these birds are chasing each other, the adults chasing the juvenile in that point. And now the tables have turned and the juveniles or the immature bird is coming after the adult. Now this is not a mating thing, but the adult has a fish. And here in a second, you're gonna see a tumble that's uh, pretty inspiring. Now they've, they've locked uh, via this fish. Uh, the immature bird is trying to take this, uh, this fish over and they're tumbling and right before you know, they get down to the lake shore, uh, they let go and, and fly off. Uh, just really an amazing display at just how powerful and amazing these birds are, but also at the same time, just what they're going through in terms of, you know, gathering food and making sure that they can survive uh, for the next day. And so those are a couple reasons why we do what you see on the screen here. We hike, uh, you know, half mile up a ridge to get to a point um, along the Allegheny um, ridge line, just at, at hopes of seeing, you know, birds flying through and following the ridge line. Um, but on top of that, you know, if we're lucky enough, we're not just there by ourselves, maybe we have our family with us. And 
while this looks great, I can tell you uh, this young man uh, does not sit still very often. So uh, this is a rare photo uh, as he's enjoying a turkey vulture flying quite close to, to uh, the top of the ridge here. Um, but to me, you know, I love hawk watching and I love experiencing migration, um, but there's something much more unique and special about it when you can share that with others. And one of the very unique things about, um, especially the fall watch uh, at Mackinac when you're on the St. Ignace side, uh, is the, the fabulous monarch migration. And I show this photo because last week we were inspired by John Richardson, who gave an example from Hawk Ridge where the counters like to have extra clickers because they found that a young child uh, being given a clicker gives them what they need to kind of keep up with their quick moving um, imaginations. And it gives them something to do to keep them out there. And so um, having some nets on hand not only allows the researchers to collect data and um, you know, grab these monarchs, put tags on them and, and send them on their way. But for, for children as young as this, it offers an outlet uh, to get them running around in nature. And not only that, you know, it's important for us as hawk watchers, especially, especially um, migration site coordinators or volunteers that are at the sites uh, to be looking for people, not even, not just young people, but everybody. Uh, and being as inclusive as you can and I love this image because it shows um, one of the ambassadors of Mackinac, Steve, um, taking you know five, 10 minutes out from what he loves doing, why he's there viewing these raptors. And he's taking a break to take this eight-year-old out collecting monarchs. I mean, what an absolute emotional connection that he is helping create for this young human being. And that's so important as we move forward, especially, you know. Uh, these days, but this is giving her a chance at making that connection. And after catching a monarch, seeing, you know, Steve and Ed welcoming, you know, people in to see the process of, you know, gathering the monarchs, tagging, ultimately letting them go, seeing them on their way, what an emotional connection that that is creating. And we haven't even talked about raptors yet. This is just a single butterfly. And so I just really wanna inspire people to, uh, to think about that, especially if you find yourself as a volunteer at a Hawk Watch in terms of involving and making everybody feel included and using ideas like John Richardson provided last week to include kids and others and find ways deliberately to make them feel like they're a part of it. And so I love, love, love this photo because of what it represents to, to me and my family. This is my daughter and we're at Hawk Mountain and very long drive from Michigan to get to Hawk Mountain. And the entire drive, she kept talking about seeing vultures, but especially a black vulture. I told her there was a possibility of seeing black vultures and she had only seen turkey vultures. So the whole trip, all she wanted to see was a black vulture. We get here and it's all fogged in. You can't see anything, but uh, the day that I led um, the group up to the point we were hawk watching, uh, a black vulture not only made itself viewable, it came in and landed like 25 feet right in front of where she was sitting. So, you know, that was obviously luck, uh, you know, having that, that there. But think about the connection that that made for, for this young person. And I will tell you right now, this is actually the day after she's literally journaling about that experience that she had. So obviously very powerful for us personally. Um, but when you think about inclusion and uh, creating emotional connections in nature, uh, it's about us being deliberate in offering that to people. And so I, I'm hopeful that um, you leave here um, thinking hard about how you can be deliberate in including people. Uh, and making them feel welcome to create those emotional connections. So with that, let's get into the meat of why we're here and uh, talk about ID. Um, before we get too much further along, I, I really wanna encourage you to use your chat window 
to send in chats uh, with questions, comments, please engage with us. We have things set up so that you can only chat with the host and that is for security reasons to keep us all safe. And unfortunately, you know, uh, the side effect of that is it makes people less uh, willing to engage because they're not seeing other people asking questions. Please, please ask questions. At the end, uh, Gail will roll those questions up and we'll make sure we have time to answer uh, as many as possible. So bird identification is, for me, it's a little bit of science and it's also a little bit of art. And obviously, you know, if you find yourself as a bird bander or someone who's really taking scientific measurements of a bird, that obviously is very scientific. But when you talk about birding in the field, Sometimes it's gut, it's, it's using experience, it's using um, impressions um, and putting pieces of a puzzle together to come up with something that's more diagnostic. And to me, that's where science and art in a way collide. And so what I always tell people is think of Raptor ID and really all bird identification as, you know, each bird is a puzzle and you're looking at uh, many pieces of the puzzle but let's say that there are 10 pieces required for you to, to definitively identify this bird. There, those 10 pieces might be a subset of 100 that you might see. And so the, the key here is to just take a few pieces of the puzzle, not just one, and put those pieces together so that you're increasing your odds of successful identification every piece that you put together. And so we have three falcons here from left to right, American Kestrel, Merlin, and then our peregrine. And there are all unique little traits about these birds, especially when you see them in the field and you're not afforded the ability to see these field marks that help bring the picture into view and, and obviously show you what that puzzle is gonna look like. So how do we do this? So the, the big thing that I always like to recommend outside of, you know, attending programs like this, reading books by, you know, Clay Sutton, Jer Jerry Ligori, you know, um, Brian Sullivan, any of the experts in the field, really always have this continual learning mindset. And what I mean by that is never think you're an expert. Never think that you have it in the bag and that, oh, I've seen 50,000 turkey vultures, I'm good to go. I guarantee you, you will make a mistake from time to time and, and something will look odd. Um, always have this mindset to continually learn. Also realize that, especially when listing birds, you're not going to be able to identify every single bird. In fact, neither do the experts. If you peruse any of the hawk count data, you will see that there are uh, budio species or unidentified falcon. You know, those will be added to uh, their hawk count data for their daily checklist. And that's okay. Don't, don't put so much pressure on yourself that uh, when, when you can't do it, uh, you're so frustrated that you don't come back. Uh, that would be uh, a big failure that you don't learn from. And so be willing to fail, be willing to learn from those failures, come back and continue to learn. And before you know it, you'll start to get some small wins under your belt and you'll start to feel pretty confident which will really make you want to keep coming back. So, you know, getting away from just general bird identification and into the niche of raptor ID, it really does require a change in your mindset. And the change that I'm talking about is exactly what you see here on screen where we see all these field marks on this paragraph, the, the mustache, excuse me, the mustache marks, um, not only the shape, but um, the field marks, uh, the speckling and modeling across the wings and the belly. That goes away, especially in spring, when you're looking to the south directly at the sun, all you're going to see is the shape of that bird and, and basically its flight cadence and, and how it's using its wings, its direct flight, whether it's soaring or actively flying uh, in terms of flapping and, and gliding. Those are the kinds of things that we're looking for to definitively identify raptors. It's not field marks. Um, unless we get that perfect view of a really close by uh, raptor that's flying through. So we really have to change our mindset and look for the shape of the bird, how it's flapping, uh, the type and style of flight. And then lastly, if you get a good view, um, plumage and field marks, if you're afforded that opportunity. 
So remember I talk about this piece, this puzzle and how we really only need a few pieces of the puzzle to really definitively ID this red-tailed hawk. Now, when that piece of the puzzle came up showing the shape of that wing with very, very, uh, a very heavy look, a very muscular looking wing, um, and then the patagial marks, you know, those plumage identifiers start to come into play. You do start to put those pieces together and see that, yes, this is a red tail, but you don't need that one piece that shows that red tail to know that this is a red tail. And if this was fully black, totally silhouetted against the sun, just the shape of this bird, especially in the east, is enough to identify this bird as a red tailed hawk. And so the point here, though, is just make sure that you use a few pieces of the puzzle, gather a few of them, not only just one, before you definitively say, yes, this is a red-tailed hawk. In terms of the general families that we're going to go over today, we have our occipiters, which include our sharp-shinned hawk, cooper's hawk, and northern goshawk. Um, sharpies and coops, you'll hear uh, called out at hawk watches a lot as we get further north towards, you know, Mackinac, whitefish, hawk ridge. Uh, Cooper's hawks tend to uh, dwindle in numbers. Uh, they tend to be a little bit more Southern. So you're gonna uh, always have more Sharpies, uh, especially in the Northern hawk watches. Um, the occipiters are your forest dwelling raptors. They're the ones that you see at your feeders. Um, and I just have to point out, I, I participated in the Hamana Lunch and Learn today uh, where Will Weber talked about climate. And he made a point about occipiters as he was talking about declining numbers of um, songbirds and how that's likely um, affecting sharp shinned and cooper socks because they like to, to go after birds, much like we see them go after our birds at our bird feeders. And so often people will come up to me and, and say, hey, how do I get this hawk away from my feeders? Well, I really wanna challenge you to think the opposite way. And to Will's point today, it was, listen, if you have feeders and you're bringing in songbirds, which then bring in Cooper's hawks, you are helping uh, raptors in terms of survival. So think of it that way. And, and my hope is that that might help. Um, second, we have our falcons, which for us, that is our American Kestrel, Merlin and Peregrine Falcon. As we can see on the screen here, our Peregrine, all three have, uh, they're all known for speed. It's all about speed. Uh, they have thinner wings that are typically swept back and to a point. Next, we have our bootios, like our red-tailed hawk. We also have our broad-winged, rough-legged, and red-shouldered here in the east uh, that we'll talk through. Red tail, like we mentioned, you know, just classic bootio soaring, open land dwelling raptor, uh, very, very prevalent. Um, and, and we'll talk to a couple of those today. Uh, next, we have our eagles. So for us, that's our bald eagle and golden eagle. And one would think, hey, there's only two, so that can't be too difficult. But if you've ever clambered onto uh, a ridge stop or along the lake shore, like Roger Torrey Peterson says, uh, if you see a golden or a bald eagle, they can be tricky at a distance. So we're going to concentrate on those two birds today and talk a little bit about um, how we decipher the two. And lastly, we'll, uh, we'll talk about ospreys and harriers today. Not the osprey, we're just gonna uh, feature the harrier today. Um, and, and, and again, this is just the general migrating hawk or raptor families. Um, and, and we don't have enough time to go through all of them today. So it is going to be a subset, but at the end, I have, we'll give everybody a chance. Uh, we'll show some of our side-by-sides where we can compare uh, two raptors side-by-side -side through video on screen. Uh, we can do that at the end with uh, whatever species you'd like. Okay, so to kick off here, all of our identification charts are going to look this way. From left to right, you'll see the range map, uh, a single photo of the bird. This is important. You'll see a soaring profile and a gliding profile. People ask, what's the difference? So the difference between soaring and gliding. Soaring is when they're going in circles, lazily soaring in circles, likely or often rate rising in altitude. Um, and uh, for a lot of birds, especially the Budios, this is a way that they gain altitude and it's a big part of their style of migration. Um, others, it's just a point in migration where they take a break or have some other need to soar. Gliding or, or what I would consider active flight, which could include gliding or uh, active flapping of the wings. This is where they might be 
uh, flying in a straight line and either flapping and gliding or just gliding. And gliding is literally, they're not going in circles, they're in a straight line, just uh, flying forward without flapping their wings. So that's the difference there. And lastly, at the bottom, you'll see some quick flight tips. So I'm gonna go through these, and then we're gonna show some video of the birds actually flying while I kind of talk you through what we're seeing on screen. And in a couple of cases, we'll see actual videos from my movie, Hawks on the Wing, where we'll compare Sharpies and Coops and, and then Bald Eagle and Golden Eagle. Okay, so uh, the Sharpies, as we aptly call them at Hawkwatch sites, uh, very, very snappy wing beat, and it's more from the wrist outward, and, and they don't use the entire wing uh, like their cousin, the Cooper's Hawk. Be careful with that square tail that everyone looks for because uh, there's a small percentage of sharp shins that will come through with very round looking tails. So you, you really can't use that as your one diagnostic puzzle piece. You really have to put you know two or three others together with that tail before you say, yes, I do indeed have a Sharpie. These guys also often have their shoulders or their wrists forward in a glide or a soar, uh, which makes their head kind of fit nicely in this little pocket. And they have very, very little head projection, meaning their head doesn't project forward in front of their bodies much at all. So they have what appears to be very small heads. So let's take a look at what this guy looks like in flight. Notice in, in a soar, almost no head visible. They, they, their heads are just absolutely tiny, very flat winged. Okay, we'll, we'll have to keep that in our heads when we see Cooper's next. Look at how the tail comes to a pinch point right as it meets the body. Uh, it almost looks like the tail disappears before the body begins. That's something that in a soar you see in Sharpies quite often. Look at that incredibly fast, very, very snappy, quick wing beat. And again, it looks like it's almost like a butterfly from the wrists outward. It's not using the entire wing. Very, very snappy and incredibly fast. You're also going to see them flap more than uh, the more stable Cooper's Hawk. Here now we have the gliding and flapping action of a Sharpie, which is very, very classic. Uh, to me, right there, you can see just slightly drooped wings in a glide. When they glide overhead, to me, they look like little button mushrooms that you'd buy in the grocery store. We'll see it here in just a second. He'll stop flapping. When you see him just right there, almost looks like a button mushroom. And did, hopefully you notice that head was kind of fitting in that little pocket and those shoulders were thrown forward in front of the body. So now when we look at our Cooper's Hawk, obviously they're a larger bird, but when you have a single occipiter at a distance, you really need to throw size out the window because you have nothing to compare that size to. Notice the soaring profile now is their, their wings are slightly upturned. So we call that a slight dihedral where the wings are just slightly upturned in a very, very shallow V. Uh, very similar glide profile in flat or slightly drooped wings. They have a stiffer wing beat, and it's a, as opposed to using just wrists outward, they're using the entire wing. Also notice in the photo how much further forward the head is projecting ahead of the body. That's a classic view of a Cooper's Hawk. And no different than we said, be careful looking at the square tail of a Sharpie. Be careful looking at the round tail of a Cooper's Hawk. Uh, there is a, just as with Sharpies, there's a small percentage of Cooper's Hawks that will come through that appear to have very square looking tails. So again, that's only one piece of the puzzle. You really have to gather a few more before you say, yup, hey, I've got uh, myself a Cooper's Hawk right here. So let's take a look at what this guy looks like in flight. Notice the wing flap is more from the body outward. It's not just the wrists outward. While it's very fast, it's nowhere near as fast and snappy as the Sharpie. Flat, slightly upturned wings in a soar that we're seeing right there. Notice the head projection and also the larger um, part of the, the, the tail that meets the body is larger and more full body. That you don't have that pinch point we saw in the sharp shin. Look how stable this bird is too. The, the bird's going to soar in larger circles. It's not going to flap as much as the Sharpie. They're just more stable throughout. Look at the head projection on this bird, just how far forward that head is pushing ahead of the wings. Wings are much more perpendicular to the body where the, sh the, the shoulders of the Sharpie was more thrown forward. Now we have active flight of the bird. We've lost 
that slight dihedral, that slight upturned wing, and now they're flat or slightly drooped as he's flapping and gliding. So that's our Cooper's hawk. Now when we look at these guys side by side, this is perfect on the right, we have our sharp shinned hawk, on the left we have our Cooper's hawk. Look at the difference in head projection. Um, you have that little pocket created by those wrists or shoulders thrown forward in the Sharpie. The head isn't pushed forward as much, nor near as much as the Cooper's hawk. And that also gives a, full, a fuller look to their wings where the Cooper's on the left has more of that perpendicular rectangular look uh, to its wings. So now let's feature a video right from Hawks on the Wing where we'll talk through and actually see these birds flying at the same time on the screen. The sharp shin versus Cooper's comparison represents one of the most difficult pairings, but there are clues that help distinguish the two. Notice the Cooper's hawk on the right has a longer, bulkier tail that also feels more round. Don't forget, however, the round versus square tail doesn't always hold true. Also notice the Sharpie on the left shows a smaller head that is tucked back closer to the body, where the Coop's head projects forward. While soaring, Sharpies will flap more often because they are less stable, where the Coop holds steady. Also look as the sharp shinned hawk is making tighter circles. The bird is actually starting to get ahead of the coop. Comparing the wing flap is easier when side by side. Notice the Cooper's Hawk has a slightly slower wing beat, but more importantly, it's using more of the entire wing, whereas the Sharpie is quicker, snappier, and flaps more from the wrist outward. Check out this Sharpie displaying its tendency to flap more often, where the Coop is gliding longer between flaps. Okay, so that's a little bit of extra, uh, hopefully a little extra help on our, our Sharpies and Coops. Uh, we're not gonna feature Gosshawk today. Uh, there just isn't enough time. Uh, so be thinking about that for the end. Maybe we can show uh, a side-by-side -side with the Gosshawk. Next, we'll get into our Falcons. And first we have our American Kestrel. I love, love Kestrels, uh, very special to us. And look at the soaring profile, very flat winged and just slightly drooped when they're gliding. They're very long. Uh, wings are very slender and, and often to a point, especially in active flight. This bird um, is in active flight and had just turned uh, ever so quickly. Luckily, I caught him in flight and got this image. Um, but oftentimes, this longer, more perpendicular shaped wing is more indicative of when they're soaring. Their wings look like banana peels. And when they're uh, flapping, it looks like they're just whipping banana peels. I love that tip that came from Eric Brunke, who uh, is a counter out at Cape May right now. So very long, slender pointed wings. They're very small, very buoyant when they're in flight, lots of up and down kind of all over the place. They're not holding true to a line like their cousin the Merlin does. Their wing beat tends to be much more fluttery and, and much lighter. And just overall, they just look much more dainty. So let's see what this bird looks like in flight. All right, so here's a soaring bird and you'll notice very long wings. They're pointed, classic for a falcon, but they're held very perpendicular to their bodies. Flat winged, again, like we said a minute ago, when they're soaring, very flat wing, so no upturn or downturn in the wing. And notice the, the bird tends to be all over the place. It's, it's going up and down and we're not even in active flight yet. This bird's just kind of lazily circling and going in and out of the wind as it can. Now, as we start to get into more of an active flight or gliding uh, position, the wings start to take on a, a, a droop, but also notice they start to sweep back a little bit and get that classic pointed swept back look. Here's the wing flap, quite shallow. It, it's very buoyant, very light and fluttery. Notice there's that down, downturned wing. They're kind of all over the place, up and down. There's that classic flat, flat, flat glide that we see in the occipiters, you'll see in kestrels and less in peregrines and merlins. So that can be a helpful thing if you see that um, in the flesh. So we're not, for, for the same reasons, we're not gonna feature merlin today. <clears throat> we're gonna go right into our peregrine, which comparing a peregrine to a kestrel is, is quite easy uh, once you kind of learn a few traits of, of each of these birds, and more or less because of just how big and much more lanky looking 
the peregrine is compared or relative to the kestrel. So these birds, especially in a soar, it looks like they have very perpendicular wings, just like the kestrel, except they come to, they come out from the body and then come into a point at the ends. And it looks like um, a burning candle flame. You'll read that in a lot of books. They're very prominent, as I said, um, and they soar very, very wide circles and they tend to be very stable. Uh, this bird that you see on screen right now is actually an active flight. Notice the tail is fully closed. In a soar, these birds will often have their tails fanned. Let's see what this uh, bird looks like in video. So here's that classic soaring posture. Think of that candle flame where it comes out from the body and then to a tip, uh, very perpendicular, or excuse me, very, um, it's very symmetrical is the word I was looking for. Right there, you can see that candle flame coming out of the body. Also notice the tail is very fanned, fanned out. This bird's in a classic soaring posture for a peregrine. <clears throat> Just a little bit of flapping. Remember we said in a soar, they're very stable and they don't flap very often. Now we're gonna see a bird that's more in active flight and you'll see kind of a whip-like uh, wing beat about them. They're whipping the air. Um, and it's also not a very deep wing beat at all. This bird is still in active flight, shallow wing beat, same shape, tail closed, very indicative of a peregrine, even though the bird has some feathers out of place. Um, it's still, we see no color, no field marks at all, but the classic flight pattern of a peregrine falcon. We'll move into our bootios now. And first and foremost, we feature our red tail, which tends to be the bootio that we compare all others to, uh, most in part because we see so many of them, they're so common. Look at the soaring profile, just a slight upturned wing, and the glide profile being flat to very slightly drooped at the end, especially depending if, if there's a little bit of wind involved, uh, that droop can uh, go down a little bit more severely. Very muscular, and when I say muscular, what I'm talking about is the, the trailing edge of the secondaries here in the flight feathers. They tend to be very bulging, and so it gives them this look of having like a bicep uh, that's kind of like your bicep inverted. Uh, that's a Bob Pettit tip that I thought was pretty neat, uh, learned several years ago. Very fast wing beat relative to the size of this bird. This is a very large, lanky looking bird. And when you see the wing flap, it's quite impressively fast. Um, again, we talked about that slight dihedral, especially when they're soaring. Keep in mind that you're only gonna see a red tail on an adult. So only the, the year old or, or um, past the year, uh, you'll see the red tail. So we'll take a look at what these guys look like. Look at that muscular wing, incredibly heavy, very stable in flight. <clears throat> when they're soaring, any kind of wind that takes them off course, they hardly have to do anything to get back on course. The, some of the other bootios will have to really flap around to, to get back on course. This is that muscular wing I'm talking about right here. Classic posture view of a red tail. As the bird comes around, you'll see again that slight dihedral right there, slight upturn in the wing on both sides. Very large, very stable birds in flight. I guarantee wherever you are right now, you could probably step outside, spend 20 minutes or so, and you probably see a red tail fly by. Uh, it's one of the, the more common ones that you're gonna see. So their, their wing flap is, is um, not real deep. It's, it's pretty powerful and um, quite quick for the size of the body that they are. Take a look at the, the shape of the body as we look at the side profile here. Uh, it's very gradual from the head, comes down all the way to the back. It almost looks like the tail and the body um, are, are one and that the tail is just an extension of that body. They're just so big and, and heavy looking even in the body. In contrast, we have the more tubular shaped uh, broad winged hawk. So notice the soaring and glide profiles are pretty much the same. You'll see just a just a touch of down droop um, in an, an active flyer or a gliding uh, broad wing, almost perfectly flat when you see him soaring. And more often than not, you're gonna see these birds soaring. You know, we didn't talk much about behavior, but behavior can be a wonderful addition to your identification toolkit. Um, and when I talk behavior for a broad winged hawk, these guys often migrate in very large groups 
at a very specific time during the migration period. So at Mackinac, they may not even have had a broad wing yet. Um, maybe they have, I haven't checked hot comp late, lately, but their numbers of broad wings aren't gonna start to show up until early May uh, into mid-May when the big numbers come. They'll have onesie twosies now and, and through that period, um, but the big numbers come and they'll come during a short, they'll all come during a, a more or less a, a very short period of time. Uh, they hold their wings at right angles to the body. They always look very clean. Notice the, the, the kind of the border pattern around the trailing edge of, of the wings, whether it's an immature bird or um, an adult, they always look really clean. Their feathers are always really well uh, maintained and in place. Again, look for the groups. That can be a really helpful piece of the puzzle. If you see a lot of the same bootio, it's likely a broad wing. And here we go. Look at those clean wings. They look like pairing knives. So if you look at the body and, and then uh, each wing comes out very uh, perpendicular from the body and then the trailing edge starts to point and come in. And then finally, they, they both start to come into a point at the end. So grab a pairing knife out of your kitchen drawer and uh, put two of those together with a body and you've got a broad wing hawk. Notice the border I was talking about. It almost looks like they have one, their wing is made of one big feather. There's just no gradation to it. Very, very clean um, contrast, some contrast there between the, um, the coverts and those, that board around the, the trailing edge of the, the wing. Very steady in flight, even as small and as light as they are. Uh, their wing flap tends to be um, a little bit more occipiter-like, definitely uh, snappier and, and quicker than the red-tailed. But again, red-tailed are much, much bigger than, than uh, the tiny broadwing. If you ever see a broadwing perched, you'll be surprised at just how small they are. Here's, here's an active flight. You can see a red-tail coming into view at the bottom of the screen. Uh, the one in the top and the middle there, that is our broadwing flapping, more or less a shallow, um, quick, and, and more or less snappy wing beat. In contrast, especially in terms of wing beat, Let's look at our rough-legged hawk. Uh, so our rough-legged is not one that you see as often, but at the northern hawk watches, that's one species that makes our northern hawk watches um, more desirable. So Mackinac, Whitefish, Hawk Ridge, they're all known for great counts of, of rough-leggeds, and it's a wonderful bird to see. So this bird, notice in contrast to our red-tailed hawk, very much thin, much thinner winged, they don't have that muscular trailing edge to the secondary uh, flight feathers. So long winged, almost look more plank-like um, and their wing beats very labored um, and it's very slow compared to the other bootios. So if you see a long slender winged bootio coming through with, with a labored slow wing beat, uh, you're looking at a rough legged hawk. They're very comfortable in the air and uh, an adult rough legged even in subpar conditions will go for the water crossing at Whitefish Point, which is 17, 18 miles, then you won't see them again. A lot of these other birds will, will go for it. They'll get nervous and come back. And that's one of the things that makes Whitefish such a great place to go hawk watching. You can see the same birds over and over and over, um, especially if the winds aren't quite right. Look at those profiles. Both of them are upturned, but a very peculiar glide profile where the wings come up in a dihedral away from the body, and then they flatten out um, to the tips. So in soaring, they it's just a straight, pretty deep dihedral, similar to something like a turkey vulture. Um, very deep dihedral, and again, when they flap, it's a very deep, powerful wing flap. So our rough-legged here in flight, look at those long, more plank-like looking wings. There's still some broadness to them, very bootio specific certainly not as rectangular as a harrier, uh, but still very thin and long winged. It's not flapping very much. Also notice that the wings are kind of in the shape of a C. They're kind of thrust forward at the tips uh, in front of the, the bird's head. And so that's a little clue. Look at that upturned dihedral. Uh, not as steep in this clip as uh, a turkey vulture, but definitely uh, steep enough to know that it's not a red tail. Also, remember we talked about the heavy body of a red tail. Look at how much more tubular and, and small the body of a, a rough-legged hawk is. The tail looks a little bit longer, and the tail 
it looks like it ends abruptly where the body begins. Here's that peculiar uh, glide profile where the wings come up and then flatten out to the tip. Classic rough legged. Like this is, I'm sure uh, I took this at Whitefish Point. Beautiful, beautiful bird. There's that tube in the body again. Okay, now our eagles. So our bald eagle and golden eagle. We'll start with bald eagle. Very, very plank-like. You'll hear me say often that it looks like a black two by eight plank of wood with a head and tail. Don't look at the coloration of that white head and tail because you've got four and a half years of different modeling and colorations of, of immature bald eagles that you have to master to figure out uh, what age you have. Uh, they're flat wing most of the time and in a glide, they'll, they'll kind of look almost curved or drooped uh, very, very slightly. Their wing beat is incredibly powerful and interestingly enough, they, their wings go up higher with the upstroke than they do below the body on their downstroke. So look for that, uh, that upstroke. So in video, look for that two by eight plank of wood. See how rectangular and perpendicular that wing is. Uh, it's, it's just like one big plank of wood. Also notice as the bird comes around, tons and tons of head projection. The heads look absolutely massive on bald eagles. And that's a big clue when you're comparing a bald versus a golden eagle. Their heads are massive on a bald eagle. There's that plank of wood, just very rectangular. That's what we mean by plank. It's very rectangular. There's no broadness, uh, broad shape to it. Very flat winged in a soar. Notice that flat, no upturned dihedral, very, very flat. Look at that slow, powerful wing beat. But look at how it's going up higher above the body than it does when it's going down below in the downstroke. These birds also end their flap sequence on a downstroke. Most flat wing gliders will end their flapping on a downstroke. Look for that in the golden and, and go there next. Now here we start to see a gliding posture of this bird. Just ever so slightly, we'll see that kind of curve or bow to the wings. And that's our bald eagle. In contrast, we have our golden. Look at the soaring profile, quite a difference. Remember, bald eagle is perfectly flat. Now we start to see a slight upturn. I, I, I kind of think it looks about the same as a red tail in terms of how high or how steep that dihedral is. Again, similar to bald eagle in terms of power with that wing flap, but much more flexible. Very floppy looking in the wing beat compared to the very stiff wing beat of a bald eagle. We're gonna see in the video, very, very small head, almost no head projection. That's a really great clue to look for. And, and also that, just that slight soaring uh, dihedral here and soaring profile. Look how much more shape there is to the wing when this bird soars around again. Not plank-like, like we saw that rectangular wing of the bald eagle. Here's that upturned dihedral. And as it comes around, look for the, the broad shape of the wing and also very, very little head in view. You're not gonna see a huge amount of head projection, especially compared to the bald eagle. Lot less head there. Slight upturned dihedral. Again, that's that upturned wing. And then look at the more shapely wing. There's just more broad uh, shape to it. It's not rectangular like that plank of wood we saw in the bald eagle. Floppy wing beat. Look, especially at the tips, you can kind of see the tips kind of flop and you'll see it here again. Remember we said there's that kind of flexible wing beat. Remember bald eagles stop their flapping on a downstroke. Goldens stop on an upstroke and then settle into their slightly raised dihedral uh, once they continue on their way. Love those goldens. Mackinac is a great place for golden eagles. So remember we talked about the heads just really quick. You can compare the head projection to the amount of tail behind the body. The heads, uh, the smaller head of the golden on the left makes the tail look even longer. In contrast, the head of a uh, bald eagle, like we see on the right, can be half the length, or in some cases, like we see here, the entire length of the tail. So look for that head projection, especially if you get a side view of the bird flapping and gliding. It can be one of the most important pieces of your puzzle. Bald and golden eagles are both large and prominent in the sky, but some key differences are easy to pick out once you know what to look for. Even though the bald eagle on the left is closer, it shows thick, rectangular planked wings. 
It looks like a 2x8 plank of wood with a head and a tail. Speaking of heads, make sure to key in on the size of the head compared to the length of the tail. The bald eagle's head can appear as long as its tail, where the golden's head appears to be half the length of its tail or smaller. The golden on the right appears more booteo-like with more muscular wings. Notice too, the bald eagle is soaring with flat wings. In comparison, the golden eagle has a slight upturned dihedral. The wing beat of the bald eagle is slow and stiff, but look at that deep upstroke. Golden eagles have slow wing beats as well, but they're uniformly shallow. Check out how the bald eagle ends on a downstroke when flapping. In comparison, the golden eagle ends on an upstroke before settling into its glide. <clears throat> okay, so into our turkey vulture. Obviously, like I said, it's really easy, like I said earlier, to, to claim success over turkey vulture and think, oh, easy peasy, got it. Just remember, always have that continual learning mindset and look for subtle new ways of identifying these birds, maybe further and further out, um, just to solidify them into that part of your brain that becomes more second nature. Like we're used to their soaring profile, very, very steep dihedral, upturned wing. They have that modified glide profile similar to the rough-legged. They appear totally headless at a distance. Part of that is the lack of feathers and the very, very small looking head, uh, which is what they've adapted uh, for eating dead carrion and getting into, the, um, into their dead um, prey. They, they will often avoid flapping. So there's that kind of old, you know, wives tale that turkey vultures don't flap their wings. Well, you're going to see very quickly in the clip, they absolutely flap their wings, but they do avoid flapping a lot. They're absolutely masters of soaring. And you will see these birds flying in every kind of weather. Um, so snow and sleet, totally wrong winds. I guarantee you'll see a line of turkey vultures come through in migration. They just, they don't care. Uh, and so the last thing that I'll say that we often see in turkey vultures is this unsteady, very bouncy, buoyant flight. So they're kind of all over the place um, as they just avoid flapping. They just let their bodies kind of lunge all over in the winds. So we'll see a little bit of that here in the video. Also that shrugging of the shoulders there, the shrugging of the wings, you'll see that a lot. There's that teetering uh, soaring or gliding that you see. I mean, it went sideways there for a second in the wind and it just, it doesn't care. It's just going to keep soaring or gliding. It's going to avoid flapping those wings. There we see a slight modified dihedral, but again, it's very steep and upturned. We're going to see it here in the soaring even better. You see that wing that's going out in the shape of a V. Classic turkey vulture. They're also very plank-like, just like the bald eagle. Looks like a big two by eight. Uh, with a tail, basically, because you're not going to see much, if any, head on a soaring turkey vulture, especially at a distance. Where's the head there? Barely seeing it. Now we see a gliding bird. You see the fingertips and the wings way at the end, and that upturn and then flattened uh, dihedral, that modified dehedral we talked about earlier. Classic turkey vulture. Hey, look, he's flapping his wings. He told me that would never happen. All right. Last on our list for today is our Northern Harrier. And again, this grouping that I put together are all birds that I think you'll have a really good shot at seeing at either Mackinac or another Eastern Spring Hawk Watch if you go at the right times. Remember these birds come at different times. So your chances of seeing one versus another go up or down depending on when you show up. Staying true to our deep dihedral and plank-like wings is our thin-winged Northern Harrier. Um, look at, again, modified glide profile. This one's a little different in that it goes up, but then it continues to go up at a shallower rate. It doesn't flatten out so much with the Harrier. Careful with that white rump. Cooper's Hawks and a few others can show, especially in winds, they can show their undertail covert feathers kind of folding up and around, which give them the appearance of a white rump. So that's not a diagnostic thing. It is certainly a helpful piece of the puzzle that you can see at a distance. Their wing beat uh, with those thin wings, it almost looks like they're bouncing basketballs. That's another Eric Brunke tip. Uh, wonderful uh, way of looking at how the bird is flapping. Just looks like it's bouncing basketballs. 
uh, on the ends of its wings. Very slender, again, very plank-like. I think at a distance, you can really struggle with determining, especially again at a distance, whether you have a turkey vulture or a Northern Harrier. So look for that in this video here. So there's those long wings, uh, very slow, powerful wing beat. We'll see it one fly a little later or flap a little later. This is a soaring bird, very, very steep dihedral. Even at a distance, there's that white rump. Remember, just use it as one piece of the puzzle. They tend to be more buoyant. And again, you saw that bird teetering a little bit, which at a distance, if you didn't have all this color and um, closer look of the bird, you might think you have a vulture way out of distance. There's the modified dihedral coming in. It's kind of changed from a soar into active flight. There's that bouncing basketball kind of look with the tips of its, its wings. And now we see that teetering modified dihedral there where they're kind of just buoyant and moving around in space. They're not real pointed and not taking a, a steady line. They're kind of crossing that line and coming back and forth quite a bit, bouncing those basketballs as it's flying towards the point of whitefish, I'm sure. Look at that long, long slender tail. Another great trait for Northern Harry we didn't talk about. Look for that long tail. It's very, very occipiter like uh, tail, but then when you look at the long slender wings, you know, hey, this can't be an occipiter with that wing shape. That's where two of those puzzle pieces come together and really help us. So now, Gail, I'm hoping you can unmute and talk to me. We're at a point where I think we could feature a couple side-by-sides, but also maybe a few questions. Yeah, hi Josh, can you hear me? I can, thank you. Okay, so some of the comments and questions we've got. First, happy Earth Day to everyone. Woohoo. And thank you, Josh, for this, for the beginning of the presentation where you are talking about inspiring young people to appreciate nature and raptors. Well done. Thank you. Um, in the beginning, Eagle video, which Eagle ended up with the fish? They kind of both did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, the, the, um, the adults still had the, the main fish. He didn't let it go or it didn't let it go. Um, but the juvenile did get some and we, it was just a, a sight to see. We were all really uh, yelling with excitement uh, when that happened. It was really neat. Okay. Um, how far north would you expect tur turkey vultures to winter and has that changed with global warming? Well, remember, we have to look at climate as more, um, you know, that long term, uh, and we won't go to get into that. But uh, I think Will or someone said to me years ago, they, they put it like this, your, um, your mood is like the weather, and your personality is like climate. And so um, we are seeing here, I, I'm in the Battle Creek, Kalamazoo, so Southwest Michigan area. And just in the past four or five years, we're seeing more small groups of overwintering turkey vultures, which we hadn't seen before. That's very anecdotal. Um, there's no science behind that. There's literally just, you know, finding these birds and, and noticing them. Um, most of the time, you know, before the last couple seasons, you'd see um, numbers of turkey vultures in southern Indiana, northern Kentucky, you know, that would be kind of the line. Um, but again, we're starting to see some in my area, um, much more than we ever did before. Um, so it is changing. Um, what's causing that? Who knows? I'm sure there's some relation to, to climate, um, but there could be other factors too. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm getting some questions about doing side by side. So the first one is, can you do a side by side red shouldered and a red tailed? Please? Sure, let's, let's do that. In active flight, notice the red tailed hawk on the left has a slightly slower wing beat. It is also more bulky and muscular looking than the red shouldered hawk. The red-shouldered hawk will also rise and fall in altitude as it's less stable due to its lighter weight. While there is a size difference between these two hawks, this is hard to realize when they're alone in the sky. In a soar, look how much farther forward the red-shouldered on the right is pushing its wings ahead. 
The red-tailed also shows very muscular trailing edges to its wings. The red-tailed hawk also holds its wings in a slightly upturned dihedral when soaring, where the red-shouldered holds its wings mostly flat. In, in all facets of flight, the red-tailed hawk will appear more stable than a red-shouldered, and when brought off course, they only need a single flap or two to regain control. Okay, I saw you doing the hand motion of the C. Somebody asked about what about the red shoulder? How useful is the red, the crescent shape of the red shoulder? So it is pretty useful when when they're saying crescent. Uh, one of the one of the identifiers of a red shoulder are these translucent outer primary feathers that give a shape of um, a crescent and. Um, the thing to be careful with this is you really have to look for the thin crescent shape of that um, translucent part of the wing. And I say that because all juvenile or all, uh, yeah, all juvenile bootios, uh, for us, let's, let's take in uh, red tail, for example, they will show translucent windows in their outer primaries, but they're not thin crescent shaped windows. They're kind of like square looking windows. So you have to be careful. You have to really look for the shape of them, but that can be a really great identifier for red shoulders. When I held up my shape of the C, it was not for that actually. It was for the shape of the wings as it's thrusting its wingtips forward. It looks like a shallow C shape overall. So I was pointing to that, not the actual crescents, but really good question. Okay. Oops. That's the wrong button. Hold on. <laughs> um, love technology. Can you do a Kestrel versus a Merlin or maybe a Sharpie versus a Kestrel or a Merlin? Yeah, let's do American Kestrel with Merlin to start. While these two Raptors both have classic Falcon wings, there are some key things to look for that will help you better tell them apart. Notice the Merlin on the left has slightly stockier wings. They are especially hefty from the body to the wrists. The Kestrel on the right appears thinner and longer winged. In fact, everything about the Kestrel is thinner all around. Be careful as both birds hold their wings slightly drooped in a soar. Be sure to pay attention to other clues. Notice the Kestrel is rising and lowering, both while flapping and gliding. In active flight, the Merlin flaps more often and is more active overall. The wing beat of the Merlin is fast at a constant even rate. They have a direct line of flight and rocket through it. The Kestrel often flaps and glides in an alternating fashion. They're more buoyant and move around a lot in their space. And I guess of those, um, this is a beginner asking, which one is more flat, flat, flat glide? The Kestrel, at, hands down, all day long. And the Kestrel can, I oftentimes, especially coming head on, they can really trick you into thinking you have a Sharpie. They oftentimes will do the flat, flat, flat glide like we're talking about, uh, which the Sharpies do so often as well. And so the Kestrel is going to do that far more often than a Merlin will. Okay, thank you. Good question. Um, on the Golden Eagle versus the Bald Eagle, does the Golden Eagle's tail pinch at the base where the tail meets the body more or the bald? Is the Bald Eagle's pinch? I would say better? both species have pretty prominent tails. Um, I wouldn't describe either of them pinching. You might see more of a pinched look in a sore with a golden when their tail is fanned, uh, just because it's a much longer tail than the bald eagle. But it's certainly not something that I, I would typically see um, in either of those birds. If you were to see it, I would, I would suspect you'd see it more in a golden. Okay. Um... What is the difference between soaring and gliding? Is gliding what they do directly after flapping and soaring on thermals? Yeah, a little bit. Um, so the soaring is often on thermals. They're going in circles, okay? 
and oftentimes rising in altitude if they found, like you said, a thermal. Um, they, the gliding happens typically after flapping, but bald eagles, uh, oftentimes, if the winds and, 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 and the conditions are just right, you could see a bald eagle glide completely across the sky and never flap. Um, so it doesn't always have to be followed by flapping. It's, it, aside from that, remember soaring is in circles, gliding is in a straight line. That's another key difference. Okay, thank you. Um, in the bald eagle video, I noticed a shiny reflective area when the sun caught the upper primaries. What is that? Trans, just some translucent uh, uh, oil. It could be some of the um, oils from preening. Um, I, that's just something I suspect. I'm not sure, actually. Um, they, in really bright sun like that, you will see those reflections, but you'll see those on other dark birds as well. But in terms of what it is, I would I would surmise that it might be oils from preening. Um, but that's totally just what I suspect. It's not something I know. Okay. Um, a question about what are your top five summer birding locations in Michigan? Summer. Uh, Barry County, for sure, which is where I'm from. Uh, there's so many specialty general birds, uh, breeding birds. You talk summer, it's all about breeding. Um, any lakeshore is excellent. Um, some of the wildlife management areas like Shiawassee, um, Fish Point in the Thumb. Um, gosh, there's so many great places. Grayling Houghton Lake is outstanding. There's marshes and lake lands up there. Obviously, the Kirtland's Warbler breeding habitat's wonderful. You don't just go see a Kirtland's. You see 75 other birds when you go, um, if you go around a little bit. Um, yeah, those are a few of my favorites. Okay, thank you. Um, a comment, thank you very much for the diagrams. They really help to clear up some confusion. Good. Um, what are the best conditions, temp, and wind direction to watch raptor migrations in northern Michigan? That's a really great question. So it's a little different. Um, there are some differences where you go, like for instance, uh, in Mackinac, partly cloudy, Oddly enough, not south winds. <laughs> a north component is, is helpful at Mackinac. You look at hawk count at their big red tail days, their big golden days, or their broad wings. It's typically, especially with the bigger birds, uh, aside from the broad wing, um, they're flying in those north winds. Um, partly cloudy is huge. Rising barometric pressure, especially the days leading up to a big migration day. Watch that bar barometer uh, as you're getting ready to go. Um, and really, you know, if you can find yourself at a funnel point like Mackinac or Whitefish or Detroit River in the fall, um, Whitefish and Mackinac are, are really good in the spring. That's what you're looking for. That's not weather related, but um, it's a big piece of it. So rising barometric pressure, uh, light winds, partly cloudy with some sun, uh, that typically uh, points to a pretty good movement. Okay, thank you. Um, a specific question. I'm in northern Kent County, flat, mainly agricultural with forest edge. When I see a hawk hovering, what are the main birds I should be thinking about in terms of ID? Depends on time of year. If it's winter, you would look at, um, if it's a bootio, red-tailed or rough-legged hawk. Uh, Kent County, especially the flatlands you talk about, it's great for rough-leggeds, but also red-tailed. Rough-leggeds rough tend to kite more. They don't hover. Um, so if you see them kind of like we saw in the Kestrel video where they're kind of flapping against the wind, that's more a rough legged hunting technique. Red tails will do that as well, but they'll also uh, hover if the winds are just right. If it's a smaller bird, uh, it's a Kestrel all day long. Um, those would be the three that I would tell you to look at. And again, Kestrel is much, much smaller than uh, a rough legged and a boot, uh, red tail, but I didn't catch if you were talking bootios or, or, um, or um, falcons. I don't think they said. Um, I guess when I heard hovering, I heard uh, harrier. Could be. Um, I often see um, harriers lower uh, along a marsh and, and they will hover, but they're, they're more active and they're kind of flying around 
and they might stop for a second and then continue on their way where a rough legged or red tailed will put a more concerted effort into hovering or kiting in place. And again, if it's summer, it's not going to be a rough legged at all in Kent County. That's going to be a red tail all day long. Okay. Thank good you. point, Gail. Real good point. Another question. Can you do a comparison of a goshawk and a sharp shinned? I don't have goshawk and sharp shinned, I don't believe. I think because of the, the sheer size difference uh, meant it didn't make the cut. Um, so when you're talking goshawk, I mean, a female goshawk can be as large as a red tailed hawk. I mean, they're massive birds. Uh, okay, let's let's forget that for a second and say we have a bird at a distance and you can't judge size. These birds are going to flap much more like a bootio than an occipiter. They're large, their their bodies are more hefty. The body, similar to a red tail, will kind of blend into the tail, never show a pinch point or an abrupt end of the body where the tail begins like the Sharpie will. Wing flap is much, much more slow and powerful on a goshawk compared to the incredibly fast, nimble, snappy wing beat of the Sharpie. Those are the things that I would look for if I had a single bird at a distance. Okay. Can you show the turkey vulture versus black vulture? Sure. Size, demeanor, and wing flap are the basic things needed to tell these two vultures apart. When soaring, the black vulture on the left has shorter wings and almost no tail compared to the turkey vulture on the right. Also notice the black vulture's wings are pushed forward when soaring, unlike the rectangular winged turkey vulture. When soaring, the black vulture will be more stable and not teeter or wobble as much as the turkey vulture. Both birds have upturned dihedrals, but the black vulture will be more shallow. Check out the wing flap of the black vulture. It's fast and choppy. They give the impression of a little kid trying to catch up with their older siblings. The turkey vulture almost never flaps and instead rocks and wobbles in the wind excessively. Even though they are both vultures, they appear very different in flight. Okay. Uh, another Drop. question. Where okay. can where can the film mentioned be viewed, Hawks on the Wing? Well, that is a great question. <laughs> and I think I'll use that as a segue. Hawksonthewing.com is your place. And what's beautiful about my website is my quick reference guide as well as Blu-ray, DVD, and digital download are available. But I also have my some of my finest uh photography out there in a number of galleries. And I also have a lot of information about where to go hawk watching, where to view some of the latest data, um, partners and things like that. So check out the website, even if you, you're not able to purchase uh, the guide. Uh, there's a lot of great information and hopefully you, you might be inspired by some of the photography. So um, Gail, we are getting to a point where it is getting kind of late. So um, certainly, you know, uh, if you'd like Gail, put my, uh, Josh at hawksonthewing.com email address, uh, in the chat for folks. If you could chat that to everyone, feel free to, uh, use that. If you had a question that maybe you couldn't get answered, um, or you'd like to reach out, uh, you can do so via that way. 